border cave in the beautiful remote Lubombo Mountains faces west from a well-wooded steep cliff. The site is on the border of KwaZulu-Natal and Eswatini, close to Mozambique and about 90 kilometres inland of the Indian Ocean. The Ingwabuma River in the Eswatini lowlands, about two kilometres from the cave, provides the closest year-round source of water. The nearby village of Inkanguini is named after the mist that often swirls around the mountains and masks the view from the cave. Border Cave was extensively excavated in the last century. The present excavations in the large cave, led by Lucinda Backwell, sample small areas exposed by previous archaeologists. Our excavations from the back of the cave to its centre span the entire sequence from the earliest occupations before 200,000 years ago to about 40,000 years ago. The focus of today's presentation is the area marked by the yellow square. Here in the 227,000 year old member 5WA, there are traces of ephemeral fossilized grass in layer DBK. I recognised this as plant bedding because I had worked with similar but younger and better preserved bedding at Sabudu Cave. To convince others of the importance of the border cave discovery, I needed to take bulk samples for laboratory analysis. Intact blocks of bedding were removed by excavating around the features, raising them on sediment pedestals. Then the raised blocks were wrapped with wet gypsum bandages and allowed to dry before removal. This is a gypsum wrapped block of DBK bedding ready for removal. It preserves the surface of the bedding. In the adjacent area where bedding was already excavated, there are humanly flaked stones. These were studied by Paloma de la Pena and will be described shortly. We needed to find out how the DBK bedding and associated activities were related to the sedimentary events before and after the bedding was constructed. For this task, I made a gypsum wrapped block through the vertical face of the exposed sediment wall. While this photograph is present, also notice the thick stack of ash in the section wall and also the small discrete ash lenses evident in the older layers. All of these exposed ash units imply that fires were frequently lit in the cave and we shall return to this issue later. In the upper photograph, the gypsum bandages are drying before the block is removed. In the lower photograph, the block has been removed, and in the scar that remains, a layer of plant material is visible lying on layers of ash. The microscope image shows a fragment of plant material preserved in one of the gypsum blocks. The higher magnification scanning electron microscope image of a fragment extracted from a bedding block is more convincingly of plant origin than the previous microscope image. Both scanning electron microscopy and phytolith studies show anatomical features like bilobate short cells, prickles, stomata and leaf blade structures. These identify the border cave plant fragments as grass from the Panacoidae subfamily. One species from the subfamily, Panicum maximum, grows pr prolifically outside the cave and in the shade of the forest on the hillside. Sandra Lennox used wood anatomy 
to identify charcoal found on DBK bedding to the camphor bush Tarkanthus. This aromatic species is still used by rural communities to repel insects. Maasai herdsmen make bedding from Tarkanthus and burn its wood in their fires. Although the 200,000 year old bedding is ephemeral now, it may once have looked like this better preserved grass bedding from 50,000 years ago in member 2BS. We made the observation that quite often in the border cave sequence, people placed grass on ash layers. This was the case from 200,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago. Ash provides a clean insulating surface, but ethnographies report further that ash repels crawling insects and various parasites. Ash apparently blocks breathing and biting apparatus and leaves insects dehydrated. Dominic Stratford rakes ash to create a foundation for his replicated Panicum maximum bedding, the soft, broad-leafed grass is ideal for the task. We experimented with 30 brown ticks, placing them in a sealed container surrounded by a 10 centimeter high wall of ash. After 24 hours, some ticks had attempted the ash crossing, but returned to the clear ring wearing ash coats. Ash may thus have some efficacy in preventing bites from parasites that would have endangered people's health. Such medicinal use of ash would have depended on people's ability to create fire regularly and at will. One of the early slides showed a thick stack of ash in member 4WA where fires were clearly lit on a regular basis. Fire was also repeatedly used before 200,000 years ago, as shown here. Ash occurs both above and below the oldest bedding layer. Every so often, ash was created by burning old, fusty bedding to clean the site for reoccupation. Such a practice would have rid the site of pests as well as sanitizing it. On other occasions, wood ash from fireplaces was recycled and used under fresh bedding. Chemical analysis of the ash can potentially distinguish its origin. Small fires were sometimes lit close to bedding in Border Cave and occasionally grass lying nearby caught a light. See the blue triangle marking burnt grass. Yet the practice of placing fire close to the bedding did not necessarily cause conflagration. The yellow star shows desiccated grass that was unaffected by the adjacent fire. Since we have excavated a relatively small area of the cave, we cannot be certain of the spatial behaviour throughout, so we have to be cautious with our interpretation. Chemical testing was conducted on plant remains, sediments and ash. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy was carried out at the site by Marine Wajisak. Marine's work is explained further in the next slide. Hello there. I will rapidly introduce what is IR spectroscopy and then give few of the results obtained with the method. So, infrared spectroscopy is a vibrational spectroscopy. It is a non-destructive method based on a radiation matter interaction. When illuminating a sample with an electromagnetic wave from UV up to IR, various phenomena occur. This radiation can be reflected, absorbed, transmitted, or scattered. The energy received and released by the sample 
provide information on the mechanic of the chemical bonds. We can make the analogy with a vibrating spring connecting two masses. <clears throat> the frequency of the radiation depends on the nature of the leak, the mass of the atoms, and the surrounding environment. So here you can see few of the results obtained at Border Cave. Amorphous silica was detected on putative plant material, confirming the presence of silicified plant material in the DBK layer. Other compounds were also recorded through the sequence, such as quartz, other silicates, apatite, gypsum, calcite, aragonite and organic matter. This corresponds to the disintegration of the cave roof material and the presence of ashes, incinerating bones and land snail shells. Now I will give the floor to Dominique who will tell us more about his work at the site. The bedding found in DB Cave comprises multiple layers of silicified grass mixed with the debris representing domestic activities and burning. The activities represent gently raked and trampled sediment that contains burnt and unburnt bone, charcoal, fibrous and woody plant matter, and grains of various kinds, labelled HAC. Under the HAC unit is a sequence of layers rich in burnt and unburnt organic matter, labelled LO, with an underlying ash microfasces labelled AS. Here, I've highlighted a few of the features found in a thin section sampling the bedding of DBK. Features 1 and 2 in image 1 show ephemeral bedding layers in the microfasces HAC. Also found as a more continuous strata in the top of image 2 and highlighted in the black stashed rectangle. In image 2, Feature 4 shows rounded grains within ashy layer AS3, and within the same ashy unit, Feature 5 shows a burned bone fragmented and compressed in place. Feature 6 shows a woody charcoal stringer demonstrating burning in the area. Phytoliths in the 200,000 year old DVK bedding show very high phytolith concentration reaching 100 million phytoliths per gram of sediment. This exceptionally high phytolith concentration has not been documented yet at any other site. In the right histogram, we compare the DBK bedding with two of the highest phytolith concentration samples so far found in the literature. The highest, coming from a room, belonging to a large residential building of the Israeli Iron Age site of Tel Dor, and the second one from a hearth from the Greek Middle Paleolithic site of Theopetra. As you can see, our samples had double the number of phytoliths. These results were interpreted as evidence of the intentional and intensive accumulation of plants during this occupation level. We suggest that this high plant accumulation is evidence for the presence of a living floor where bedding was constructed by past inhabitants for their day-to-day -day activities. The high percentage of anatomically connected phytoliths is indicative of the good state of preservation of the phytolith assemblage. The bedding at Border Cave is mainly comprised of a variety of grasses from the Poesia family. We compare the anatomically connected phytoliths identified in our bedding to extant South African grasses from KwaZulu Natal and the Cape South Coast, and found resemblance to few Panicoideae species, and mainly to Panicum maximum and Panicum destum, Melinis repens, Cetaria pallidefusca and Temeda trianda. The highest frequency of tree leaves at the top of the bedding, as we can observe in the histogram, might be representative of different, but unknown, plant processing activities 
carried out by the site inhabitants. The high presence of dark colored phytoliths demonstrates that the bedding was burned at some point. The VPBK ashy layer placed under our DBK bedding also show very high phytolith concentration and mostly of grass. The high percentage of anatomically connected phytoliths, similar to that observed in our DBK bedding, is also indicative of the good state of preservation of the phytolith assemblage. We found that mineralogically, this ashy layer mainly contain apatite, possibly carbonate hydroxyl apatite. Although the apatite can derive from guano and bone, as is the case in many archaeological sites, it can also form from the genetically altered calcite or high concentrations of organic material. Several studies have shown the diversity of the chemical composition of grass ashes. In our study, we observed that apatite is present in the ashes of Panicum maximum, one likely bedding grass. Therefore, the high phytolith grass concentration and good state of preservation, the high presence of dark colored phytoliths and microcharcoal, and the apatitic composition of the ashes led us to consider that VPVK was an older grass bedding that was burned before fresh grass were placed on its ashes, which could have acted as a repellent for our bedding. People at Border Cave continued using ashes under their bedding. Flakes, blades and small chips occur abundantly in the DBK bedding. These demonstrate first that people made and used the bedding and secondly that various daily activities such as making and using stone tools took place there. Many small chips are a byproduct of stone tool making and the presence of refitting flake fragments that you can see in the left image marked C demonstrates the good preservation and the integrity of this deposit. Plotting with a total station, see the image on the right side of this slide, shows that stone tools were made and used in and around the bedding. I am Daniela Rosso, and I conducted with Francesco De Rico and François Orange the analysis of red, orange, and yellow microagglomerates of ochre identified in the layers containing the bedding. We systematically collected them and noticed that they are considerably more abundant and differ in size, morphology, and color from those present in the other layers or falling from the cave roof. Chemically, there are no significant differences between the fragments found in the bedding and those found in the other layers. Their abundance in bedding layers, however, may indicate that ochre processing or loss of ochre powder from objects or human skin occurred while using the beddings. Modern hunter-gatherer camps have fires as focal points. People regularly sleep alongside them and perform domestic tasks in social contexts. People at Border Cave also lit fires regularly, as seen through the sequence, not only in the layered ash and grassy sediment of the DBK bedding. Before 200,000 years ago, close to the origin of our species, people could produce fire at will and used fire, ash and medicinal plants to maintain clean, pest-free camps. Although hunter-gatherers are characteristically mobile, cleansing camps can extend their potential for occupancy. The simple strategies inferred from the border cave data broaden our knowledge of lifeways in the remote past. They also provide a glimpse of the early potential for the cognitive, behavioral and social complexity that is more widely evident in innovative material culture, such as personal ornaments, new napping strategies, and novel bone tools 
from about a hundred thousand years ago.